My name is Neil Westfall. Today we have Tanner Wayne on the podcast to talk about being a drum tech, and he is a very good friend of Adam and I, and we have known him for most of our adult life. And it's really cool to have him on to be able to talk to him and have him tell his story of how he got into drum teching and, you know, starting as an artist and all of that cool stuff. Yeah, it's cool that he comes from San Diego, which is where I spent, you know, past 10 years of my life. And so I met him here and toured with him a bunch. And he's kind of gone back and forth between being an artist and being a crew member. And because of that, he has multiple perspectives that he's really honed in on. And I think he has a great understanding of all the different levels of touring, all the different dimensions of touring. And I know we discussed a little bit, Neil, we love how much he talked about, you know, mental health and self-care. Yeah, he really has it. Like you said, all the different dimensions that he's seen touring, he he knows it from a crew member's side. He knows it from an artist's side. And he understands the importance of taking time out for himself and really focusing on maximizing and sustainability when it comes to touring and not overworking himself, kind of just taking that time and, and really being a badass. I mean, I don't really know what else to say other than that. Tanner is incredible he plays for some of the the biggest bands in the scene you know scary kids scaring kids chiodos he currently plays for in flames another fun fact about tanner that i've heard through the grapevine and i never realized because i'm such good friends with him but he never wears sleeves he's never worn a sleeve he doesn't wear shirt sleeves he always wears cut off shirts yeah that's like his thing i talked to danny who we haven't had on here yet but he's like oh yeah i toured with tanner he was on um miguel with me and that dude never wears sleeves and i asked tanner he's like yeah i don't wear sleeves I always just maybe thought he was just wearing an Ed Hardy shirt. No, I just thought it was like a really nice shirt. (laughs) It turns out that his actual shirt sleeves were gone. Yes. Well, then before we give Tanner our mighty send off and welcome to Don't Shit on the Bus and listen to all his knowledge, we have to knock out our favorite part of the week. Our new patrons. Elise. Hiroberto. Justin Trotta, the young trot god. Yeah, Squid is his nickname, and he will actually be a guest on here in a few shows. We appreciate your support, Squid. Then we have Robert. My boy, Troy. Josh. And freaking Bridget, the best person on this list because she's the last one and they are badass. And that's about one a day, which is really good. So we're almost up to 100 patrons. We appreciate you guys all signing up and look forward to the conversations with you guys in Discord every week. Anyways, here's an amazing conversation with our really good friend Tanner. We've known him for over a decade and we've toured with him from every position to drum tech, uh, hangout tech, actual drummer. Yeah, he'll just appear in countries and hang out. And I'm just like, I don't know what you're doing, but you're here and I like it. Holy crap, we're in uh, Switzerland. What are you doing here? He's like, what are you doing here? And we're like, we're hanging out with you. And he's like, exactly. And then we just hang out after that. Speaking of hanging out, here is us hanging out with Tanner for another hour. Lots of gems are dropped, so be ready to pick them up. I was telling Adam about the first time we met Tanner and you were outside. It was like at Warp Tour in San Diego. You were just like outside of Prada's bus. You're like, you smoke weed? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah, dude, I love weed. You're like, cool, let's get high. I'm like, all right. I thought you just said, yeah, dude, I'll have weed. <laughs> Probably did. <laughs> it is funny how like the relationships and the friendships I've had would be so different if I didn't blaze. It's same. I don't even know if I would have met anyone. I probably would have never left our dressing room one time. I would have just been like the weirdo that just fucking sits there and plays like Diablo 3 or some shit like but that. But think about those relationships in comparison to like if you did coke or like something like they would never last. They'd be trash. They'd be toxic. But instead. They'd be just different people. I'd be like friends with like. But you wouldn't be friends with them still. Yeah. I mean, if you if you were doing blow, your friends would be dead and like or you'd have like enemies <laughs> and shit. But because. Because we smoked weed, we're all still friends. We all still talk. Yeah. It's good stuff. I think that it helps no matter what industry you're in, when you find people that you not only share a common career with, but you share a common hobby with. And that can be something as loose as smoking weed or as serious as, you know, I don't know, working on cars. I caught myself one day, just I was at a mirror in Hollywood when I was living in LA and I was just pouring sweat for no reason. And I was like, maybe I should switch up my health routine. I was drinking like venti coffees and the venti coffee would hit too hard. So I would dab the dab hit too hard. I'd venti coffee, bang, bing, bing, bong. And then next thing you know, I'm just pouring sweat like that for no reason every day. Just hippie speed balls 24 seven. We're adults, dude. I mean, like, look at this j pack i just got you know what i mean it's got like lavender in it and shit it's like you're going to coachella when you just have a little j yeah but i'm like i'm like on the grass out 
outside instead just like there's like dog shit i can hear it from out here that's all that matters dude like i'm leveling my escalating life up that's awesome dude i love that all right we've got tanner here on the line welcome tanner hey guys thanks so much for having me it's really a pleasure don't sound too excited it's like the price is right dude i'm trying to like trying to give the people what they want you know yeah like you just won by landing on the dollar yeah like i just won like a blender or something like something awesome (laughs) you're so hyped you're like thank you for this blender i have to pay taxes (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Half a blender. What if you <laughs> won 20 Adidas on The Price is Right? Then what would happen? Probably flip them. My parents were on Price is Right. Would flip them. When I was a little kid, Price is Right was like a fucking life goal for me. I was like, you know, you'd stay home from school. It hit there at like 11 o'clock in the morning. I'd be like, fuck yeah, I love Price no is cable? Right. Oh, I mean, we had, the, you know, there's some rough years. Yeah, we had the, the access channels. Yeah, Price is Right. That shit was so sick. Like, what would they win? Like, just the most random things. Yeah, like stuff as a kid that I would like never. It'd be like a piece of gym equipment. I'm like, oh, like I want to win it. It's free. <laughs> you fucking got it. Did you guys see that documentary about that guy who cheated the system? He didn't cheat. He just got really good at it, right? Four prices, right? It was sick. He just memorized the prices of shit. <laughs> that was so. Yeah, he got everything perfectly right, like on the dot. They're like, how much is this uh, can of tuna? He's like, 99 cents. Nope, 98 cents. (laughs) Yeah, he sat in the audience and like studied. Dude, that was a really sick doctor. Yeah, I respect that. I heard a story about how so many people deny the prizes because they can't afford to pay the taxes on them. So like they'll have like people that win like a fucking car and they're just like, I would love to have the car, but I can't have the car because I can't afford to pay the taxes on it. So we're not going to take it. You shouldn't have to pay fucking taxes on a fucking prize. Like get with it. Come on. Yeah. You have like three family cars already and they're like, here's an RV, a hundred grand a year. Like, yeah, there should be some sort of option of like an opt out give me five grand or give me 10 grand instead of this burden. I think that you should run for government in California. This is a point you're running on. Any prize money, no tax, free weed. Free free weed. Tanner, you are here today to talk to us about being a drum tech on tour. And honestly, I couldn't be more excited because you're one of my favorite people I've ever toured with. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it, man. I wish we've actually like toured more than we think when we speak. You know what I mean? Because we've only actually done one tour together. Yeah, I think it's like one tour together and every California show date I've just like seen you at. Oh, I'm in Hamburg, Germany. It's like, holy shit, what the fuck's Tanner doing here? I actually have been going through all my photos that I have ever, and I screenshot whenever I find a photo of somebody, and I'm like, hey, they might like it. And Tanner is my most screenshotted person because he literally just will appear at shows of artists I'm with or be in another country with somebody and have an off day. You have the right personality for this. Like, you know, it's one of the first things that you have to have as a person who's getting into touring is... You have to be someone that you can be around. You are around people 24 seven. You live on top of each other. And if you're a good hang first, like you can kind of not be the best at your job. Not saying that's what you should go after, but it's definitely makes it better. I think you're a perfect guest for this situation. You know, I appreciate you. What I was going to say is that I feel I feel bad for like the person that, you know, that like does a good job and like would be great on tour. It means, well, when you're around 13 people now, you might be a nightmare or Maybe I know that you can't handle a onstage nightmare. You know what I mean? Um, So it's an interesting world. And that's why there's not so many of us that have lasted the 15 or 14, 13 years that we have, you know? It also kind of goes back to, to like you putting out that reference to somebody is kind of putting your name on the line as well. Like you don't want to go out there and be like, hey, this guy's, you know, he's great at what he does, but you put him in there and he kind of has that situation where he's on stage and has the meltdown or, or has the situation where someone eats his food on the bus and he loses his shit. You don't want to put yourself out there and do that either. So, I, I mean, I kind of understand that. Nobody wants to be that guy because, you know, your word is everything. Yeah, because you can't come back from that. And at the end of the day, touring is more than hanging out and working. There's such little intricacies of specific humans that inevitably it just doesn't work in a situation where you're with 14 to 30 fucking people. And it's, it's, I'm lucky to be where I'm at, but I'm also like, uh, I'm not thick skinned. So like there's situations where like dudes are too gnarly for me and I'm like suffering the whole tour or true. They're like old school tour dogs. Almost you would call it where they're like too strong handed. Or I'm like in on the Miguel Sia tour and I'm like, not, what is that world? I'm not not mainstream, but I'm not like whatever that world is. Like I'm not that world. We're like hardcore 
we're on the smaller scene scale in, in a sense. That's like arenas, big arenas or stadiums. I don't know how big see a place. I won't, t- I won't say what me, well, I thought I met you Pomona Warped. Yeah. If that makes sense. It was like the first day of Warped Tour. I remember what we did that day. I was uh, in- introduced to the Lizard crew. I don't even know if we were a crew yet. That's why you're like, no, it OG. wasn't a crew yet. It was, it was a, it was pre form, but everyone was kind of getting into the, the vibe of it. You know, we were doing what you do on Warp Tour. We were passing the time trying not to get heat exhaustion and 110 degree weather standing outside of buses with generators on. That's what you do. But also like probably completely dehydrated, yeah. <laughs> higher than we should have been, like probably just like living off like, I don't know, random like candy drawer snacks. Oh my God. Can I tell a story really quick that you just reminded me of? You said candy drawer and it reminded me of Devil Wears Prada and how Alex Shellnut would sneak onto the Devil Wears Prada's bus and take candy from their candy drawer and then fucking leave. And like he wouldn't say anything to anyone. He would just go on their bus and just gank a little snack and then leave without saying anything and then it happened so many times that they didn't call him out on it but we wrote a rap song dissing alex for stealing snacks from the candy drawer on prada's bus and then we played it to him and he like heard it and he's like i didn't know anyone knew that i was doing that (laughs) we're like dude you've been doing it all warp tour you stole their snacks every day. That's pretty funny. Not chill, chill on that. <laughs> Back to uh, being a good person to tour with. <laughs> well, when I met Tanner, like, I'll be fully honest, Tanner has told me this since then, like, I would fall into the category of what people would consider a punisher because I kind of learned how to exist on the road through people like Tanner. So I appreciate you not kicking me off to her, maybe, or whatever, whatever. I appreciate you guys toughing it out and teaching me because, you know, I had some skills to learn. I don't, what if, what do you think somebody should do if, like, they want to go on the road but they're worried about their social abilities like how do you become not a punisher like what's the thing that goes through your head i mean typically it's like i don't think there's a lot of pre-work to be done i think you have to throw yourself in the fire and some dude might scream at you or you might like i don't know it'd be gnarly to come to the realization that you're a punisher on tour where you're like already vulnerable you're already nervous like you've been given this opportunity and then you just find out you're a punisher just to reiterate what a punisher is it's someone who might not take social cues well who might be kind of an annoying in certain situations who might overstay their welcome who might they just don't read the room well yeah it's about reading the room and, and like we said in the first season like that is a huge huge thing when it comes to touring because you're around so many different personality types so many different people you have to read the room you can't come in and be fucking loud when everyone's being quiet you can't like just fucking eat a bag of chips while someone's watching a movie it's like that kind of shit it's like you have to like be aware of what's happening around you and kind of be different based on what's happening you don't you're not a fucking bull in the china shop you know what i mean it's like we're gonna start a reality show where we like we book like 15 people to be in a small room together and like the first like every time you're a punisher you like get kicked off or something and that, that'll like the teach opposite kids. of big brother yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of like yeah it's kind of like that like real world or something but they like didn't vote did they vote him off on real world i don't know how it's oh you had to get kicked off for being like too drunk or something all i remember is like the one guy smacked the girl and then like it was like the smack heard around the world i'm really old you'll have to youtube me i didn't have cable it's probably like fucking season one 1984 real world tanner so your journey like when did you start you started in a band right is that how you started in the music industry i was born in a lab i'm a lab baby <laughs> took a couple pieces and a, uh, and a little bit of lavender and they just made this yeah as cheesy as it is like i am so 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 lucky my life is a movie like every especially because like you guys have had, i mean elmo you've had a crazy career of all over the place but neil you've been pretty in a certain cat you know you've been in a day to remember this whole time whereas like i've been in like fuck 25 things you know what i mean and it like only gets more trippy of each step that it takes because spring break of senior year my parents let me leave whether they knew it was allowed or not but because i went on that i met chiodos i joined chiodos because i met them through undermined and then like the snowball of just like neil said like me being a dude that's okay to be around and meeting people meeting people meeting people it's just like everything has led to the next and it's really trippy yeah you're good at it it's like the perfect story of what it is to be a good person and a good person to be around because in those situations you would have never fallen into the next opportunity if you kind of sucked you know like everyone would just been like well not him you know like we were around 
around him, but you know, he's a fucking great drummer, but maybe not him. It wasn't like that at all. I think the fact that you are an incredible drummer and you are a hard worker and you are all these things, that is just a bonus to how good of a hang you are. So we will kiss after this because that's like the road I'm going down with all these compliments. But you know, you got dad love right now, dude. I mean, that that's <laughs> the funniest thing is it's all taken a point to where in flames hired me because I had hung out with them a couple times a week on the tour that we did. And I guarantee I have this huge feeling that they never heard me play drums ever. And just because I would come hang with them, they hired me. It's huge. It really is. Just to clarify here, I know that we have Tanner today on talking about being a drum tech, but Tanner's career has gone back and forth of being a drummer and or a drum tech. So when he's talking about Into Flames, he's actually in the band right now. But Tanner, after Chiodos, so you were drummer for Underminded, a drummer for Chiodos. Can you list off your path and what you did for each artist, if that makes sense? So just walk people through your journey real quick. Just a TLDR of yours. So that's what's funny about the beginning is that I fell into being a drum tech. I'm not a drum tech. You know what I mean? Like every drummer is a drum tech to an extent. You have to be, you have to set up your own stuff just like a guitarist is at some point. But, you know, we're not fixing things as much when you're like an amateur guitarist or you're in the beginning stages of your career. But I fell into it because I scary kids pretty much said, hey, keep coming on the tour with us and you can be our drum tech. So when I was an Underminded, we did a tour where it was Chiodos, Scary Kids, Emery, The Devil Wears Prada, Underminded. So on that tour, I was hanging out with Scary Kids a lot because I think they had a bus and I just wanted to be comfortable and maybe sleep there. And yeah, eventually they said, hey, continue on the tour and be our drum tech. Yeah, so it was Underminded, Scary Kids, Drum Tech, Scary Kids, Drummer, Chiodos, Amir drummer, Chiodos drummer, Amir drummer, and then LMFAO drummer. Oh, I forgot that you did that. Yeah. Did you do Shwayze? And then Shwayze drummer. And then I drummed for this band called Candlelight Red, which was like a smaller, cool, like little new metal band. And then drum tech for Suicide Silence, drum tech for Cannibal Corpse, drum tech for Thy Art is Murder, drum tech for Atreyu, drum tech for Of Mice and Men. Drum tech for Miguel, drum tech. Now Miguel into drum tech back from Of Mice and Men, drummer of In Flames, and then and then I drum tech for the weekend. But I also played for like Mod Sun and whatever else random stuff in between all that. Yeah, you just you were just constantly on this wave of like, I just want to drum or fix your drums. Tire me, I'm doing it. For me to say it, it is on the spectrum of me like borderline begging fools. Like it was not like I'm not sitting in this chair going, what? What do you need? Okay, yeah, I'm there. Cool. It was like me like working at a dispensary or like Uber. I was Uber driving in the middle of this stuff. You know what I mean? So like, it was just me grinding and like hoping to God I can get back on tour. It's like music was your calling and you had to be a part of music because everything else seemed kind of like a waste of time, you know? No, it wasn't that. It was that I can't do anything else. That's not true. I feel that. No, I feel that. All right, I'll step out, but I feel like he's good at shit. No, not even saying that. I get what you mean. I, I could, of course, all of us could go be, you know, all of us could go back to college tomorrow and become doctors that are sketchy, but like, we all have <laughs> the willpower to do other stuff. But for me, like I just haven't had the drive. My drive is music. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah I absolutely feel that. I mean, like you said, it's like whenever we, we were open our restaurant, it's like I was in there like washing dishes and I'd be like, man, the pandemic is n- I'm now a, a dishwasher at a restaurant. And the whole time I'm like, the only reason I like doing this is because I happen to own this place. But it's like if I was coming up, it's like that was really hard for me. I always had a really tough time being like, I should be playing music. I should be working on something. I need to be creative. I need to be doing this. I don't have time. I don't have the want, the power to to just do this because I you just can't. It's not the same. You know, from of Mice and Men was saying something about excited he is to put out music this year because he felt like last year he lost that um like validation, like being who you are and all the hard work. So yeah, like moments where you're dishwashing. But for me, that's what's so funny that you say that is because I'm so obsessed with food and I've worked in the restaurant industry, whatever, but I'm so obsessed with food, so obsessed with cooking that I'd be so pumped to be in my kitchen doing my dishes. I'd be like, this is mine. No big deal. Like, do you have the big squirt rig? That's the only way it was cool. Like I had to remind myself, I'm like, this kind of sucks because I'm burning the shit out of my hands and I've been doing it for two hours and my fucking, yeah, my back hurts or whatever. And then I'd be like, ah, but it, you know, this is me and my wife's restaurant. This is pretty badass. And then I'd be like, who the fuck am I? And then I'd like, 
at work, I'd be like, hey, I got to go take a meeting. We talk about doing some fucking live stream or something. I'm like, oh, yeah, this is what we do. Adam would send me a video of like at Warp Tour. And I'm like, yeah, I think Neil texted me. He's like, I forget who I am sometimes. No, it's a real thing. I, I think that that actually happens. No, I vibe that. I'm glad that I've practiced like being a normal human so much amongst all the crazy touring, like not practice, but you know what I mean? Yeah. I've been forced to be an Uber driver or work at a dispensary or do whatever. And that really helps because like I could only imagine what certain people are going through. I've seen a couple of my friends are like having a really hard time and it makes complete sense to, to have your whole life planned out for you, your whole life booked out for you. And whether you're in a really successful band or not, and then all of a sudden it's kind of taken away. So I'm glad that I've like been prepared in a sense for this kind of lull and touring. But anyways, yeah, drum tech stuff. What do you got, Adam? <laughs> I mean, now that we know who you are. OK, so, yeah, knowing what you do, we know you're a drum tech, but like what skills do you think you have that help you qualify this for this job other than being a drummer? Or is it just that you're a drummer and you kind of figured it out? No, because I think because I started at such a low level in terms of shows and everything, you know, I was playing like 100 cap shows that was such a perfect place to like see how the days run. And I think if you were somehow, if you were just some Joe Schmo and you knew drums and you were like telling everybody, yeah, dude, I like, I know drums, you know, and let's say you're thrown into an arena tour. It has nothing to do with your drum skill. Your drum building skill has everything to do with your hyper awareness of where you should be, what you should be doing, timing, like all the little things that are kind of impossible to get in the first couple of days of being thrown in, into tour. And I think we're lucky that like, you know, a day to remember wasn't a monster 24 seven, you know, at some point you guys were a smaller band and you were able to see how things are run, even if you were a guitarist. So it's tough because I think you definitely have a higher chance of getting fired. If you get thrown into this big tour and it's your first tour, there's just so such a weird thing in regards to the day schedule and what people not to step on their foot and to know the production manager and to know the stage manager, there's so many little things that have taken me probably a decade to learn that it's tough, dude. But like, what are the skills you would say that you would have like as a going into like a, to being a drum tech? What are some things that you have to have to do that job? Yeah, so it's a mixture of you're trying to please, let's say, two people every day, the sound guy and your drummer. I've had gigs where the sound guy hates me, but the drummer loves me. So there's weird dynamics, but you want to have the drum sound so good. Your sound guy is completely happy with you and you can kind of go, okay, he's pleased. Now focus on the drummer. Cause at the end of the day, again, you could set up drums, right. And do whatever your drummer might not be pleased. So in a sense, you're not necessarily babysitting his ego, but you want to make sure and you want to be non-punisher worthy attentive to your drummer and kind of make sure that he's comfortable every day because again everything could look horrible and sound horrible but if your drummer's happy you're at least doing 50 to 60 percent of your job right well then they're confident and they can go out and put on that show that they need to that makes everyone else in the band feel good makes them feel good they can go up there and know that they don't have to worry about oh my shit's set weird or this symbols too far away it's like nah i feel confident i know my guys got me yeah trust you got to develop trust with your the dude that you're working for for sure this is just a little side tidbit that i thought was really interesting i know outside of maintaining the drums and making sure your drummer is happy don't you have to like order all their gear and that involves kind of some relationships with gear companies like you have to maintain all that too i know it gets harder as the artist gets bigger or rather more time consuming but what's that like so the smart thing to do when you start working for a dude is in the beginning, figure out every single thing that he needs, including that, so that moving forward, you don't all of a sudden get into some situation where you're not doing something right. So yeah, in the beginning, you ask beyond everything else. Yeah, you're going to ask him, hey, what's up with your sponsors? Because let's say for Tino's sake with Of Mice and Men, I had a direct relationship with all of his sponsors and he... I was directly responsible for everything for um, what would they call that stock, let's say, of all of my tools, yeah, upkeep, the drum heads, the sticks and everything. I was the only person responsible for knowing that 
and ordering that and having those relationships with Tino CC to everything. So that's like some managerial skills. Like you kind of got to go in and know what kind of stock you have, keep those relationships up. You got to have that good communication as far as like email and all that. And then you have to like implement those things on a daily basis of kind of keeping a running inventory so that you're not in the middle of nowhere and you run out of sticks because there's not a guitar center and you're screwed. Yeah, it's tough, especially when you're in Eastern Europe and three out (laughs) of the five people you're dealing with are either not responding or not really helping. And now you're having to find European addresses and overnighting stuff. I liked doing that, you know, as long as it doesn't kill me stress wise, I love getting in those positions because all it does is teach you and, and it has you prepared for more stuff of mice and men definitely bumped up my game in, in terms of a tech. But yeah, because at that point, you're a manager of in a sense, you're a stock manager, you're and then what's it called when they need that list of stuff before you go into a new country? A carnet. Carnet. So that's a huge one too, is that I've never done before is dealing with the carnet and having, man, that was such a nightmare. Having every single piece of gear written down with the code numbers on everything down to the symbol, down to the sticks amount. And we would have to do that. Sometimes we'd have to do it once a week, Ugh. every single piece of piece of gear that we had. So for all you listening that don't know what a carnet is, basically it's like, it's a complete itemized list with every serial number of piece of gear that you're bringing into another country. They understand how much you have and how much you're leaving with so that you don't take stuff from their country to another country without paying taxes on it. It's basically a way to make sure that they're getting all their money they're, You're not bringing stuff into their country to sell for a profit without paying them. It's also, a good way to kind of keep track of all your stuff as you move from country to country. Can I tell a carne story? Yeah, please. I'm a photographer, obviously, and I travel with tens of thousands of dollars of gear. Oh, yeah. Well, I've never got <laughs> flex. Flex. <laughs> and I've never gotten in trouble for not having a carne, nor did I know what one was until I got in trouble coming into the U.S. from Europe in 2014 at the Chicago airport O'Hare. And I swear to God, this security guard was just trying to teach me a lesson because he was like being a dick to me because I was wearing Wearing that full body suit, itchy and scratchy pink pajama thing from Drop Dead. <laughs> and I think it looked like an asshole. And this dude was like, I'm going to fucking rock this dude's morning. Not today, asshole. And he like told me all these things. And I was like, God damn it, I'm never dressing this obnoxious again in an airport. It's like usually you just kind of float behind the scenes. You're like wearing all black. You're just like a little shadow, like kind of floating through security and shit. Like, what do you mean, bro? It's just a cannon, dude. <laughs> Damn, Tanner, your impressions of me make me sound so flattering. They're trash. I'm so sorry, man. I'll be like, yo, what's up, brother? They cannon. <laughs> I'd be like, oh, Adam, I'm a Caius. <laughs> <laughs> Can I tell one more story? I had a time where I went to Sri Lanka with just crew. Artists left us. We flew there and landed. And this was a new crew I was working with. And I'm not kidding you. A kid in the airport in Sri Lanka came up and asked to take a photo with me. And that shit never happens. And the crew was like, what the fuck is going on? It was pretty funny. Because he knew who you were? Yeah, we're Sri Lanka. Because they thought you were Jeff Bezos. I was Bezos. just like, this never happens. They thought I was Jeff Bezos. It was like some guy from America on a mission trip in Sri Lanka. It was just some freak coincidence. But it still was funny. Dude, Adam, I have gone places with you where you've needed your own security. You were, what? it was in Mexico City. We were getting bootleg merch out front and we were out there and they're like, move out of the way. I need to talk to Adam Elmacias. I'm like, yes, sir. I'm sorry. I'll just go over here and buy this a day to remember merchandise at our show. It was like five dudes and we walked down the street and it was literally, I have videos of it. It was insane. But that's also just that area of the world just loves everything having to do with music. Yeah, they're fanatic. They are, they're very appreciative and they love their photography photography because you give them the ability to see all of their favorite artists in the coolest way that they they're like Adam he is king he hangs out with everyone I love I love I mean it's so rare for us because even if we're in a big band like we don't have security that's not normal and I love having security guards in Mexico City that shit's fun oh it's so badass they have like machine guns and shit (laughs) well mine definitely didn't have that we did that deep purple tour yeah, I had to like, I had to give them all my credit cards so that they could sign up on the scooter app so that we could scooter around Mexico City together. I don't know why. Uh, that's fucking sick. But yeah, that was fun to have like a bunch of giant fools just like watching my back like through Mexico City on scooters. It was pretty sick. The scariest for me real fast, like I've been to places where they had machine guns, but the scariest for me was when we were in Brazil and we just had one guy and that's all they needed. And I was like, this dude murders people because he's like, 
like he's not even that big but he's really strong and he, he has guns but i can't see them i don't know where he put them but he was just like i know where he put them but it was like yeah this dude is a badass that's all i know you have to have it in brazil you're like you know john wick you fucker <laughs> Probably went to high school with them. Let's jump back on the rails, right, Elmo? What are we talking? We talking skins, symbols. Daily responsibilities as a drum tech. What would you say those would be? So if you're smart, you'll try to develop like a schedule within yourself to try to meet like certain deadlines, certain times, like have the drums built by then, blah, blah, blah. Just so with yourself so that you have a more confident setup and you don't have to like stress as much. But El Makaias and I talked about it. It's yeah, it's Groundhog's Day. It's typically unless you're doing some radio thing or some weird flying thing. Well, drum techs, I think I was thinking about this earlier. Drum techs, the weirdest, sometimes depending on your gig, my gigs have been the most stressful, but they're, it might be the most stressful gig in the team because you have to do way more than anyone else in the same amount of time. So you unload either the truck or the the bus together. And in that moment, it's as if someone said, all right, time, go. Because most guys put their amps on stage, they turn it on, they do a couple things, and they start working on guitars. Drummer has to set up, let's say, 40 things in, in that same amount of time. So from there, it's as if the buzzer goes off and I am lightning, speed, setting up all the drums, immaculately exactly how they need to be set up because it's always set up like set up perfectly and then it gets scarier because now you're having to change things or fix things so i think drum tech is like one of the scarier timed things because you're having to do so much but again if i was sitting next to someone on a plane they asked me what i do i unload the trailer i build all the drums i put them on stage when they have to be let's say we're headlining now i have to line check my guy comes up for a sound check and then I either cover that with a tarp or, you know, however, a sheet, whatever, or I go put the drums away. That's your whole routine basically before the show. That's my pre-show routine. I mean, so it's like basically like you, you set everything up, you kind of make sure it's all good to go, fix things as they need to, go into sound check, make sure your guy's all good. And then you set it up for the show and then until that show, you're kind of, that's time for you or how does that work? Yeah, typically it's, it's rare that you'd have to do other stuff. You might have to fix some stuff, but but I feel like that's, I guess, the the chill time in comparison to the guitar techs. The guitar techs are typically working the entire day. So I guess that's the difference of me or saying that, oh, when we start going and all of a sudden I'm all rushed. But that's because I have to build stuff and put it away, whereas typically guitar techs are. Yeah, they get a little bit more time. It's like once it's done with sound check, usually if you're not the headliner, your drums are buried. So it's like you better get everything you need to do done in that amount of time because they're going away. Perfectly. Yeah. And then at that point. You do your thing again. If it's a situation where you're having to take drum stock and do emails, that literally takes maybe 10, 20 minutes. You know what I mean? So that's not really the biggest part of your day. So it's like a hurry up and wait kind of situation. Yep. Hurry up and wait, go and stretch your body out, stretch your mind out, do whatever. And then um, a lot of the time you'll have to set up a practice situation for your drummer. It's like load in, you set up, you set up the stuff on stage, then you go set up a practice rig. Where do you put that at? So that's tough because now you're having to focus on two whole sets of gear, even if it's not that big of a practice routine. But now you're responsible for two different places, completely different places in the building. I've had to set up in hallways. I've had to set up in weird spots, but you're hoping that you have a dressing room and you set up just a couple things. He might have a ton of things, but you set up in the corner away from everyone um, so that you're not in everyone else's space. And you just confirm right then that your drummer's cool with that and comfortable as hell so that you can actually go and relax and chill. Yeah, it kind of gives you that peace of mind, like let yourself be like, all right, now I can relax. I know I did all that stuff as good as I possibly could. And it's like the more days you do it in a row too, like you said, it's Groundhog Day, you know, first couple of days of tour, you're figuring those systems out. But by day 14, those systems are like well-oiled machines. You can kind of have that peace of mind. Yeah, if you're able to develop that system, then everything is a lot easier for yourself. And you don't, it's a huge thing of not forgetting stuff. Because again, if you're setting up two different sets of gear in two different places, there's a lot of factors that can be forgotten. And your drummer who's not doing anything all day long might get pissed at you 
without realizing that like your head's spinning and you're trying to make sure all these things are working and you forgot to kick practice pad in the corner and blah, blah, blah. So the more you develop a system of tasks that you need to get done every day, you'll be a better drum tech and you'll be a lot you know, there'll be a lot less stress. When you set up your drums or when you're getting stuff set up for you, I know our drummer, Alex, he has to have things like perfect. It has to be the same way every single day. Is it kind of the same for you? Like, do you, is it down to like a measurement thing? Like where things are taped? Do you have to like build those kind of setups and systems when you start a new tour with someone? And that's the thing too, is or as early as you can figuring out what kind of artist you're dealing with in terms of their specifications. Cause a lot of my dudes don't care at all, but like there's dudes like Tino. And again, it's not a knock at Alex or Tino. It's just dudes have to, you know, you're going to be on stage for two hours every night and you want to be comfortable and some dudes need certain things. So there is a measurement and you're hoping that you're working with good enough gear to where when you put it up every day, you're not having to go and measure stuff every single day. But the drum tech would have a very discreet, perfect carpet set up to where it's brainless and you can just go up and set the stuff up every single day, every little lock in every single piece of gear is just you you want to set it up to where it's foolproof you want to set yourself up to where you're you're not able to really make a mistake in your day it's like you can minimize the oh shit moments when there's 20,000 people watching or there's 150 people watching or anyone's watching you can kind of work those things out like at soundcheck yeah and even if you're working for a lackadaisical dude in regards to his setup and his specifications you still just preferably for yourself want to set up as clean as you can every single day the same exact way so that you just don't have to get into those moments of stress or feeling like you're not taking care of your artist that makes sense really does and another factor is also making sure that the other bands let's say that we're in the headliner situation you're almost playing as a stage manager as well to where you don't want either someone to touch your stuff as you know aggressive as that sounds but there's just moments where people might be stepping on your foot quite literally and you not only want to pay attention to all the cables and all the most important little things that can get messed up but also be a good dude to the opener bands and potentially help them oh yeah so that you can because it all is a group effort to get stuff finished by doors because even if you're the most well-oiled machine a lot of the time doors are pushed back and so on and so forth yeah from there it's your little time in the day and if you're like me and you like to sleep until it's time to work it is literally your only time in the day to you know read a book go and get some dinner Mm -hmm. do everything that you can to like make sure you don't drive yourself crazy just like, like for me it's like peaceful things going to do yoga do it's just your private time and typically that's only a couple hours that's something i've always admired about you and related with you on is i like your tendency to really prioritize self-care and i know it's been a journey for you over the past years but you know i love hearing that you know you just take a break in the middle of the day and do some yoga that's what's up yeah but like i've told people before i wish i didn't have to you know what i mean i wish i could just go smoke a three gram blunt and eat a cheeseburger but the older i get that is not like what well, it doesn't last yeah yeah, yeah no one's gonna last wait like that. smoking a three gram blunt and eating a cheeseburger isn't aligning with your current health goals no it used to be that used to be like having a decaf coffee they'd be like oh pff, all right let's rock this show okay i'm asleep now but no the older i get the more i have to pay attention yeah to this delicate fragile little brain i have Hey, respect. Well, I know too. It's like in those situations, it does work, right? Like you obviously got to where you are and you were doing those things, but it's a very short-sighted way of living because you can only do it for so long until you start to fuck up. And once it hits and once you can't take it anymore, you're like already in a hole. You can't get out. It feels like you're like over in over your head. And I think doing those preventative things like doing yoga, taking that time for yourself are so important. And a lot of times it's kind of like yourself is always the last thought about thing. You know, you're like, I got to get this fucking drums done for this dude. He's going to be super pissed if I don't do this. It's like, nah, I got to take this second, make sure my head's on correctly, because then your work's worth so much more. You're like any of us, like us as human beings are worth so much more when we take that moment to kind of grasp ourselves and pull us back together and then go into a situation fully like level headed. Yeah. And at the end of the day, if you're lucky enough, you're on tour more than you are at home. 
So you have to develop those type of routines to where you kind of shake yourself out of it and go, wait, I'm on tour for the next 13 weeks. Like you're home in a sense, you know? So it's almost as if, what do you, what would you do if you're at home? Do you need to go get a run in? Like, I remember when you guys were doing insanity and like to be a dad joke, that would be insane to other bands to think that you're fitting in this high intensity workout in between your stuff in that day. But there's just Certain people need certain things. Some people can just go get hammered in their time off. And a lot of us, I think, especially these days with the older we get, health is such a huge part that, you know, just maintaining your mental health, I feel like is a huge aspect of tour that some might not realize. But obviously, I think, again, the more as time progresses, the more people, the mental health conversation is becoming more prominent. And that is definitely a thing, again, if you're on tour more than you're at home. I think when when we were younger, it was kind of corny, but it's like it wasn't corny at all. It's just we just didn't understand the value of it yet because we could go and get drunk and then wake up at eight o'clock in the morning and get on a flight and then play a show the night. And we were just burning the candle at both ends until we saw what it felt like to kind of lose that. That's when you're like, all right, I got to take care of this because it can go away pretty quickly. For sure. And I think that we had to have those moments. You know what I mean? Like, I'm so lucky that I didn't have high anxiety and high blood pressure, whatever it was at that young age, because it is fun to just be a trash can and, and also be able to handle it. You know what I mean? Like for me to do those scary kid and under oath shows, I was playing twice a day to be able to handle that as well as have a poor diet and be smoking weed 24 seven was like, that's a superhero. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh, yeah. That's what I was going to say. Everyone thought of you as a superhero because you're like up there killing it with Under Oath, do, still playing another set. And it's like, how does he fucking do it? And he's like always smoking weed. I'm like, yeah, and I was probably burning a thousand calories a set and like eating <laughs> cheese tots in between. Whereas like now if I had to do that, I'd be like meditating and doing Wim Hof breathing techniques in between the gigs. I've been doing that every morning for like four weeks now. Sick. I was doing it every morning for a couple months and I, I stopped. It's crazy. But like you were saying, so right after doors, that's your you time. That is your time to kind of like pull it in, do these things that are important for your mental health. So like, as you kind of wrap that up in your day, like you, you just get on eating catering or whatever. Do you go and check on the drums to make sure everything's good before the show or how does that work? Yeah, I'd say it's not the most necessary. It depends how much it depends how much you got going on and how much you're actually able to be on stage and do the little prep work. And again, it always is per gig. It, some gigs, you might have a mountain of electronics and you might want to be there a little before, or you might go up and your shell nuts rig and, and there's five drums and it's, or four drums. It really depends. So yeah, from there, you want to get on stage and make sure all the other bands have respected your cables and have respected everything else. So that the moment the changeover happens, you are more than prepared to get your job done. Not scrambling. And that just falls in alignment with your whole day. Just self prep so that you can or you're able to do your job what's the fastest changeover you've ever had to do i had to set up alex lopez suicide silences 37 piece kit in 10 minutes oh goodness oh my god before cannibal corpse and i had to get off stage in like three minutes oh man and that was most of it was okay but we were playing hawthorne theater in denver portland Portland. which is a nightmare it's like a small door to a hallway to a small door but i'll always remember that especially because on top of that i was working for cannibal corpse so so you wanted to like make sure that that shit was happening because you had to get back in there to fucking do your other dude's fucking drum kit right yeah so i was working for both bands i had to get my stuff on do the show get it off in three minutes get the other cannibal corpse kit to get the cannibal corpse kit on stage now and prepared to do the whole next show you are a psychopath that's important when you're working when you're working those kind of smaller size tours to really capitalize on your time out on the road you can only be in one place at one time so if you can work for multiple people that's a great thing as long as everyone's cool with that, that you're working with yeah th- we did a it was on mayhem fest so those were all sideshows. And long story short, there was this party that event sevenfold, I think, through. It ended with a cop grabbing the drum tech of Cannibal Corpse's arm and breaking it in half. So I had... What? <laughs> like he broke it in half at the bicep too. So I had to take over from there. Jesus Christ. Was it the Terminator? Like how the fuck do you break someone's arm in half at the bicep? That sounds insane. They were trying to put him on the ground. So he... 
he was probably like this. He already had like, he was already like most of his body was on the ground and they ended up just like kicking through. I think oh. it's the humorous. I don't know what it Did is. Did he get a bunch of money for that? I feel like that's a little bit. Yeah, I think so. I, I almost want to text him after and know his name's Phil. He's like the shreddiest of drummers. Yeah, he's like such an epic drummer, but I think he sued the whatever it is, the police station or whatever it was in Oklahoma. Jesus Christ. It was a sick story. They tased, what's his name? John Singer of On Broken Wings. Yeah, they tased him. He ripped out the tase, the, the tasers, whatever the hell, threw it back at him. They tased him again. He grabbed it and he ripped it out of his chest again. And then he ran to me who was already left the who already left the party and <laughs> he was like dressed up all different. He's like, yo, bro, they just tased me a couple times. I'm like, what the hell is going on? Jonathan Blake is crazy. John Blake needs a podcast, dude. I think he would be in, indicted for half the stories he would tell. That's what I was going to say is that, you know, 24 <laughs> out of the 25 of the stories are completely legal and he'd have to like <laughs> wear the mask and talk like this. The funny thing is I have a story where I went to an Unbroken Wing show and they brought airsoft pistols and shot the crowd. They look like real guns. It was at this Magic Fest show in Orlando and that's just like one of the actual stories that I lived through and they thought that that was a good idea and that Holy was fucking crazy. Hell. Oh my yeah, God. they're like true East Coast hardcore like crew. Everyone's just like this. What the fuck is going on? I just got shot by a fucking baby or some shit. By the band. I'm like, all right, well, I got a fucking mosh. This, uh, I do my crosswords <laughs> and pins. Time to fucking beat the shit out of half the crowd here. That's fine. I'm cool with that. Can you imagine the people that listen to the podcast? Like, not imagine, but like probably most of the people that listen to the podcast did not come from the world we come from. And the stuff that's normal to us is quite far from that for the majority of the population. So they're probably just listening being like, what is hardcore? I never think about like, oh, I wonder how this is for the listener. Because like, we're just a couple friends that could talk for probably five hours especially because we we haven't been hanging out at all you know but hey guys hope it's hope it's super informative so far love you now i think it's pretty cool because you get some kind of insight into like really the relationships that are built through touring and like what it takes to like we haven't seen each other in probably months you can come on here and talk to us like it's has no time has passed and that's just a testament to like how close you get to people when you're on the road and how much time you spend with people when you're on the road and just that kind of type of person that just to kind of touch on what we touched on earlier it's it all goes back it's full circle yeah and i mean i think you guys are a like teaching people about how wrong they are in their assumptions of what a quote-unquote roadie that's how the older people would say it is i feel like it, it, it is a informative in the sense that like if i told someone that i was a drum tech first of all they might not even understand like what what do you I, and then a lot of people go oh you're a roadie yeah for sure i don't like that term we've never used it once i think it's kind of cool that we're doing it this way because i think a lot of times whenever people have negative experiences with people that are on tour that would that would technically be called roadies or usually be called roadies like they're probably just making mistakes and that's how they were taught that that's how things go and and one of the cool things that I think that we'll be able to do with this podcast is kind of hopefully avoid a lot of that shit. Like you don't have to go through the hazing. You don't have to deal with any of this other like weird fucking trends or whatever fucking situations that people get treated like shit. I think it's just them making mistakes and then them kind of falling into that pattern. Whereas people coming from this new generation post COVID fucking touring situation, hopefully they can avoid that and just be fucking nicer and everyone kind of like work together from the jump, you know, like even the people that were like fucking road dogs before it's got a whole new generation coming in we haven't done the show yet right doors open drums are taken care of artists gets on stage what does the drum tech do during the show so at that point it's you and the sound guy it's you and the sound guy time that is nothing else but y'all so you you get set up if you have electronics you get everything fully fully prepared as soon as humanly possible so the moment the the sound guy asks you to hit your kick drum you are ready because that is literally the only thing you should be focusing on is getting everything to where you're literally sitting in your chair boom because everything's uh, you know so you might be working with a different band that has an hour changeover but a lot of the time it's a really quick changeover so you want to be prepared you're typically first in the lineup of uh, the sound guy needing your audio and you're just waiting on that call for the kick drum. This is the front of house sound guy, right? Not the monitor guy. Monitor guy, you typically won't have to deal with. He should be already like ready to go dialed in. If anything, he'll ask you for some stuff after. But yeah, you pretty much just want to push your kit to where it needs to go. You want to turn all your electronics on and make sure everything's good because 
especially if you have in-ears, you're going to be emulating what the drummer is going to be experiencing. So you just want to make sure that you want to think in your head, okay, I'm the drummer, I'm the drummer. How, how comfortable am I? All right, where's the seat? Where's my water? Maybe you're passing the waters to the guys or getting some towels. It really just depends on what level you're at at that point. But you just want to set it up to where your drummer can jump on and he doesn't have to think and he can do his job. And then throughout the show, you're kind of just, uh, maybe you can give a few examples of things that might come up during the show that you'll kind of like fires you'll have to put out. But like, what kind of thing happens that disrupts that? Yeah, so that you can write a book on that probably. And it depends which gig, you know, with the weekend, I literally sat maybe 50 to 100 feet away and I didn't have to do a thing the entire time except for watch out for security guards when I was filming a song. But yeah, so at that point, you might be right behind the drummer watching him. So let's say for a day to remember of Mice and Men, you are psychotically staring at every single thing, every single little lock and whatever. Because a lot of the time, if you're a good drum tech, you can prevent stuff from happening from seeing it before it happens. And yeah, from there. Yeah. So let's say for like Tino of Mice and Men, he hits really hard. So stuff is going to happen. Stuff's going to break there. You're always going to want to stare at the sticks. I think that's the thing you have to stare at the most to make sure that they, if they break a stick, boom, they grab another one, boom, you're putting another stick in there. And you're literally just doing, what is that? always sunny quote, ocular, ocular pat down. You're doing an ocular pat down on the kit the entire time. Ocular pat down. Using your eyes to make sure everything. <laughs> yeah, you're using your eyes. You're literally looking from hi-hat to China the entire time, making sure, you know, you might honestly like some, I can pat myself on the back to say that I'm a pretty good drum tech in that regard because I'm just super neurotic and I'm just staring at everything. But I will notice a crack the moment it happens on a cymbal and I already have the next cymbal prepared. And within the song change, I'll throw, or even during the song, I'll put the extra cymbal on and throw the other one to the side. It really depends. You know, for a tray, you whenever for a tray, you I had to place the microphone in front of his face when it was those perfect singing times. It just really depends on developing what you need to do for each artist that you're working for. That goes back to your initial statement. Like before I even started about anything, you're like, the main thing here is that I'm learning, you know, these artists, I'm learning what they need, when they need it, how and where I need to be. And that is the majority of this job, the actual technical side of it, tuning the drums, fixing the drums, ordering the parts. It's not super difficult. You just have to either know it or you don't. And the rest is a long process of learning. That's why you with 10 years of experience gets hired and not me who, you know, there's a lot of reasons you shouldn't hire me. Me, but you know that's why it goes to hyper awareness like i a lot of gigs have had to do the playback so playback for who those that don't know if you hear fun keyboards and chimes and bells and backup vocals there is a computer running those things so a lot of gigs i've had to be the space bar guy i've had to start those songs in accordance to where you hear the singer announce the song and you have to perfectly set the song off right then. And if all goes well, nothing will happen with that computer. With Suicide Silence, there was moments to where there'd be a mess up with, I'm sorry, but the drummer or the computer, that something would happen. And I was psycho enough to go and find the 808 that was coming. And I would put my marker back on that 808. And the moment he hit it, I would put the whole band back on click by slamming that 808 in that moment. That's dangerous, but you can do that because you're a drummer. Exactly, yeah. So You can be on time. Like I would be like, whoops. And that. the click is like everybody has it in their ears and it's what everybody plays to, so they're all at the same moment. I think that's definitely the craziest thing I've done. Typically, it's a well-oiled machine. You have a good enough app and a good enough computer and a good enough system to where it's pretty foolproof. But in those moments, I, I was like, okay, I'm just going to slam them back on with an 808 and just put them back all on track. 808 heartbreaks no con no it's my least favorite kanye album really what hot take what which one do you like i'm sorry yeezus is higher than that for you oh yeah i love yeezus what else is another one the newest one is higher than heart heartbreak i didn't even listen to that <laughs> okay so heartbreaks is above the jesus one yeah for it sure. is you're right all right i didn't that one's not even on the oh my beautiful dark twisted fantasy is my favorite oh yeah that's that is like a perfect album i think i had to look them up because i don't remember the names but my beautiful dark twisted dark yeah. twisted fantasy is that the one with good morning yeah. on it Ooh. yeah good morning is that Dude. that the little movie he put out oh, that's not on there where he's like driving with the cherub and the fucking 
and the angel that fell from that shit was beautiful. And then he's like, Dah. and he's like playing APC or whatever, like the white APC. And the, oh man, what have I? What happened, Tom? What happened, Doug? Oh, graduation. That's my favorite album. I love graduation too. That's some purest shit. That's not my favorite. I love that one. That was like that was the one that I fully got deep dived into Kanye. I liked the one before that, College Dropout. But then graduation was like I was there when it came out, and I was like, yep, fucking love this shit. Show's over. It goes according to plan. You don't get fired. You know, you switch the, to the 808. You got everybody back on track. All right. So loadout. What do you do for loadout? OK, so that comes to like when I was saying earlier in regards to like a timer going off, like you have the most stuff that you have to put away. So it is stressful as hell. A lot of gigs that I've had. In those moments, you are, that's like another neurotic thing that you have to set up for yourself is like this quickest way that you can pack up all your gear, you know, and I'm, I'm neurotic about that stuff because I want to do a good job and I want to be able to finish fast for everybody else and kind of just go to chilling instead of loading out for four hours. Yeah. You want to get it done. You want to be efficient. And so you have like a system that you're like, all right, timer starts. I'm doing this, 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 you know, you're hammering it out. There's a method to that madness. Yeah. And it's not, again, like most dudes just unplug and they push their amps off stage. I am like, okay, saying to myself, okay, symbols first. Okay, boom. All right. I have all those 12 symbols in a pack now. Okay. Now we're doing shells. All right. Oh my God. I have to clean a little bit. Okay. Now I'm going to throw all those perfectly. And, and, and at the same time, you're doing this to set yourself up for the next morning. That's huge. Yeah. So now you have the shells away and, and I've never had a setup to where it's comfortable. It's always packed to the, to the most psycho brim of all your cases. So you really want to be neurotically perfect about your pack up game. So yeah, at that point, you're just very, as fast as you can, you're packing up all your stuff perfectly so that you can wake up the next day and be ready for the next day. And then you chill. So yeah, once everything's packed away and you have the locks on the trailer, it's time to relax. Typically, there's no need to be doing any tasks at that point, emailing whoever. It's typically pretty late at that point. So from there, I typically, depending on the human I'm working for, I'll go and ask my drummer if he had a good show and see, because a lot of dudes don't want to talk about it. Some dudes are hammered at that point. I was going to say, what kind of, what signals you to go and ask or what doesn't? Some guys, you know, to never ask because they don't care. Some guys want to have a little meeting with you and a meeting might be just you guys talking for five or 10 minutes in the hallway. Yeah. And just again, you just want to set yourself up to where you never have to worry about anything. So those talks are what are going to allow you to take some mental notes of the next show's needs or the show after's needs. And you're going to learn what you did right and wrong during the show. But yeah, it just depends on communication. It depends on your drummer. When I worked with Tino of Mice and Men, he definitely was a, a tentative to what he needed and what I did well in and what it, what I did wrong in. So the more talks you have with your drummer, the more the better communication you have with your drummer, if that type of communication is available, will just set yourself up for a smoother tour. And it's not really something that you want to get into the mode to where you don't have to have those talks is pretty much the goal. You want to be that good. You want to be like perfected towards like, good job tonight. This part, one little thing, tweak it, but you're good. Yep. Yep. The more you're having to have talks about stuff, the worse. So yeah, you definitely want to set yourself up to where you are, your drummer looks at you and hands you a beer or something. I know that there's a certain, with my tech specifically, I don't even have to say something. I like look at him and he knows. He's like, yes, I know. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen again. Like you don't even have to say that, but he just knows. Like I'm like, look down at my guitar and he's like, ah, shit, it's out of tune he, or something. You know, like he just knows those, you build that good of a relationship with whoever you're working with. And that is more than just the show. That's like you hanging out on the day off. That's like you guys getting to know each other on that like hyper aware level like you were saying it's worth everything it is hey one question tanner do you wear shower shoes or not oh on tour yeah yeah i was like what kind of fucking house do you <laughs> think <I live> in? <laughs> i mean you have a meg ramp in your backyard i don't know yeah i wear shower shoes though we shower outside in this moat <laughs> no dude i i think about that stuff sometimes like even uh, there's been a couple times where I do, but like, dude, even like European festival showers, I've never, I, I never shower with sandals or shoes on and I've been 
If I get taken by the guy from Saw and he tries to do some weird shit to me, I'm completely fine based on the showers that I've taken in like Russia and like Eastern Europe and shit. It's like they couldn't introduce things to my body that I haven't already seen and dealt with before. It's like COVID came along and I gave it Neil. You know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> shit was fucking no problem for me. Do you wear them? No. None fuck. of us do. Yeah. Come on, let's go. Yeah. I, I've had like shower. Dude, we can do a whole podcast about where we've showered on tour. There was like I was on oh, tour with Skin in the UK and they had to like walk us three blocks to like this underground building to where the lights turned off every like minute and we'd have to go find out where it was and uh just to take a shower <laughs> just like ridiculous all right I wanted to know your guys opinion on this I went to do laundry at my place today I don't have it in unit it's just you know on our property and somebody left this months ago and I just nobody's taken it and I think it's so funny there's a bag in there that says free kitty litter good for oil spots <laughs> <laughs> and i'm just it's like salts, dude you don't get the drug game who Adam. was giving a, who's giving away a bag of free kitty litter? it's not that big it's like this big like it has to be worth two dollars why like would they just leave it in there? you know how much that dude that that's like the maintenance man trying to look out for the parking lot and see if there's any oil spots out there he's like yo i, I wish r.i.p our maintenance man passed away in december Dark, no dude. wonder it's been there that's why he left it there in december and he's trying to like protect you guys from the afterlife oh, wow i feel like there's like a movie in, in this we're talking about like there's definitely it's like maintenance man in the outfield or you know like definitely in the outfield but i can call m night Shyamalan. we can start we can start figuring this out thank, thank you tanner. tanner sorry i appreciate your time man guys thank you so much for having me honestly like my aura is like a different color now it's like a shade of turquoise even though i'm colorblind it's like neil's hair honestly yeah, that's good color i felt it i don't know if neil's hair is a turk because i'm colorblind gonna put that in there again but i just love you guys i love all you millions of listeners uh uh, subscribe like and if you want to venmo me it's tanner wayne it's just tanner wayne he accepts uh, money for if somebody venmos you that would be funny and i think the fact that you said it again i think it's going to happen i'll take partial bitcoins and if you have any shares of stock you want to toss my way maybe some gamestop maybe some nokia yeah just love you i love you guys too get it bro kevin scaff plays the guitar riff that takes us out it's a metal ver or punk pop punk version of wheels on the bus in your own words do you want to kind of tell him send it to cab dog hey kevin it's tanny dubs how about you uh riff, riff us, us out, out of here, here bud, bud.